Is it time? Hi, everybody. Here Hello. we are, St. Matthew's Bible Study Group, and we're happy to meet with you again. And uh, we're, we're progressing through the book of Mark. And uh, I've been reflecting on some things, both Jewish and African, and a few things I thought I would put in a little a side note this time, because we want to save most of the time for this chapter, because it's very powerful. It's very loaded with important things. And in reading it and studying it, I began to think, you know, wow, what is this? What does this mean for us today? What did it mean to them back then? But at any rate, I dug in some other sources about Mark the Evangelist, sources that were completely separate from our textbooks on African memory of Mark. And we get some agreement in, in terms of what uh, led up to the Gospel of Mark. And we know that Mark was not native to Judea or Galilee, uh, but on the other side, he had great familiarity with Judaism because there are many uh, citations or allusions to the Old Testament. And we know that he was very familiar with Greek as a second language. And we know also there is a strong tradition that he was the interpreter for Peter for many years. So that is an influence on this gospel that we'll continue to pick up on. And in tonight's study, we have the transfiguration where Peter is one of the uh, disciples that goes with him and uh, goes with Jesus. So we're sure probably it's reasonable to think that Mark got a version of what happened at the transfiguration from Peter. And we see Peter in some of his little gaffes and not <laughs> understanding what was going on, which is common to the whole book of Mark that many times the disciples, it's a mystery to them what's going on. And that's how a tradition grew up about the secret mark, because it seemed to be that Jesus was telling people to shut up. But there was a meaning and purpose behind that too. So we know that Mark interpreted for uh, Peter. We know historically uh, Claudius became emperor in 49, 41 and 49. And there was an edict expelling Jews from Rome. Uh, and this short period of 41 to 49 exists for this confrontation that was going on. So if we take 45 as an approximate date, clearly Mark would have come to the Christian faith before this. And the uh, Clement reports that Mark had already followed Peter for a long time. So if we also credit Papias, another church father, uh, Mark was independent of Peter for a time and not yet his interpreter, and later became his interpreter. So Mark writes an account of Jesus' words and deeds according to Papias. And we think that there were two sources that were drawn on. You may have heard of the, uh, the script called Q, meaning quell in French, quel. And it, it's a hypothetical 
script because no one has ever seen it, but it's been excised from a number of texts and it consisted of sayings of Jesus and was probably very early before any gospel was written down. There was also a resurrection narrative and this seems to have been also very, very early. We have some, some airplane going over. Maybe we need to close our windows. Uh, but at any rate, uh, all sources say that one thing is certain, whatever Mark wrote down was not our present canonical text. And it probably was built in layers over time. And uh, what Mark wrote down in Rome was the content of the gospel that which Paul talked about and the account of the death and resurrection of Christ. But Mark drew on Peter's preaching and compiled the passion uh, narrative. But uh, sources say both Peter and Mark would have had to leave Rome by 49 under that edict of Claudius expelling all the Jews. And Peter uh, had met his purpose. He was moving into areas where he would be of more help to Peter at this point. Uh, and tradition reports that Mark died in 62, which was several years before the death of Peter. And Peter was persecuted during under Nero, traditionally about 65. So Mark, had a faithful interpreter and I mean Peter had a faithful interpreter and Mark was his representative in Egypt so we're back to to Africa again mm -hmm. and they probably ratified Peter's Mark's gospel to be read in all the churches sometime about 61 to 65. But we know that the composition goes back several decades before then. Uh, so that is one component of what I found in our uh, studying for today. We, we see in tonight's passage again, the terms, the son of God and son of man. And we gave you a handout a while back about that. If you didn't get it, we can send it uh, to you again. And we see that uh, Jesus uh, says, Elijah has already come in this chapter. And that didn't make sense to me, but sources I have suggest that Elijah was uh, being used for John the Baptist, that John the Baptist had come. And at this wonderful transfiguration, uh, we see Peter is wanting to build booths. Uh, there was a a uh, tradition in the Jewish uh, life of booths, and they had a sacred meaning, meaning to them. And it is thought that Peter perhaps wanted to prolong the experience, but it is one of those things that when it happens, it happens. And the way it is described still leaves us with a good deal of mystery about what actually happened. And I think for myself that there are so many layers there 
And the best we can hope for is in our worship to re-experience that transfiguration where we become more aware of who Jesus was, where he came from, that Moses and Elijah were forerunners for him, and Jesus is one who's attempting to, to make this a living experience as opposed to what we talked last time a little bit about religion of the book where it's becoming more a religion of experience. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, there's much we could say about that, but I think the most interesting uh, material here is actually in the chapter. And uh, But I still wonder, what did Peter tell John Mark? about the transfiguration and how did that get turned into the visual, very powerful uh, visual picture you can have. We know that mys mystical experiences often are more visual. Words may be limited and in this case, God speaks and says, listen, listen. And the uh, disciples are uh, overwhelmed in a sense, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there for now. Let's move on into the material of this chapter because there are several major parts in the chapter, not just the transfiguration, Though I must say that's my favorite. It's the one I spend more time thinking about. John, what are your thoughts tonight? Well, this is another one of those chapters that uh, has a depth and breadth to it that uh, could probably be spent in a semester class just, just studying this chapter nine. It is so full of, uh, so full of meat and uh, there's much to be said, but like you, uh, Martha, the transfiguration is the, the, uh, the recorded event that uh, strikes me uh, most clearly, most, uh, most poignantly and We've probably all heard the uh, the term having a mountaintop experience. Uh, very obviously, um, James and John and Peter had a mountaintop experience, and uh, <clears throat> the the whole transfiguration is an event that uh, is really not only just. Uh, an event, but it's mystical, it's spiritual, and it's uh, it's uh, awe-inspiring, and it uh, uh, gives the disciples a uh, a real conversion experience. I feel uh, I have to I have to call out uh, Peter on in this. Uh, Peter is a favorite of mine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, my middle name is Peter, so uh, I think maybe my mother had some idea. Peter, as we know, um, is the rock, and uh, I think maybe that that's uh, that that that's a term that uh, not only is that Peter is the rock on which the church is built upon, but he's also a rock in terms of his grasping and understanding. Um, He's a little, he's a little slow on the uptake, oftentimes, <laughs> and this is one of the, this is one of those instances. And you've had this, he's having this wonderful, magnificent, mystical, spiritual experience, and yet I get the impression that even though booths have a tradition in the in the Jewish uh, 
in the Jewish uh, tradition. I, I get this impression that uh, my, my feeling about this is that Peter is not fully grasping the magnificence of it in the sense that it's mystical and spiritual and that he wants to make it more concrete. That he wants yeah. to, I've often said that uh, he's faced with the magnificence of God living in the flesh and he wants to build a theme park there. And so <laughs> that's his, that's his, that's his res response to this one. In reality, what takes place here is something that is indeed transfiguring, not only for Jesus, but also for the disciples that experienced it. And if we look at what's going on here, um, it's significant and transformative for Jesus because it takes Moses, who is the embodiment of the law, and it takes Elijah, who is the embodiment of the prophets, and both of those are there together with Jesus. It's almost as if they're giving an anointing to Jesus, that they're uh, passing the torch, as it were, where the law will take you so far, the prophecy will take you so far, and now there's Jesus who's going to take you the rest of the way. And so he has, he's being, uh, in many ways, uh, legitimized by the presence of Moses and Elijah. And then finally, he's being legitimized by the voice of God the Father saying that this is my son. So he has, you know, he has had this full um, indoctrination, anointing, um, what else can we call it? Uh, uh, benediction, um, a, um, just a, uh, an overwhelming uh, support for himself and his words and actions. So that's, that's, that's the first thing that touches me with that is that, that uh, Jesus is being, um, he's being uh, legitimized. And I don't mean to say that he was illegitimate before that, but his mission, his message, and his ministry are being touched by all of the major points, the law, the prophets, and indeed God's word himself. So uh, we know that, that the other two also came in clouds of glory, as it were, at certain mm -hmm. times when Moses was bringing the tablets down. Mm -hmm. Elijah went away in a chariot. Right. So they had a, a similar special significance in their time and some kind of uh, supernatural experience associated with both of them. And now we have it coming together, as you say. Right. Jesus. Yes, yeah, so Jesus at this point is, uh, you know, he's being ordained. He's being ordained by, uh, by, by the, uh, those factors that uh, have both uh, tradition and, uh, as you say, Martha, they, they have an, uh, a, an extra uh, level of spirituality attached to them. So we see that. That's the first thing that strikes me about that. The second thing that strikes me about the about the transfiguration is um, the disciples themselves. They um, they can't possibly ever in their lives before and or since that transfiguration they can never ever be the same. They can never uh, not be touched by what they experienced. And what they experienced in many ways uh, 
has to stay on the mountain. You know, it has to stay on the mountain. And we see that, uh, you know, the, uh, the disciples kind of want to, they want to stay there at that space. They've, uh, they've experienced Jesus in a way in which their lives will never, ever be the same. More so than when they first joined up, more so than when they saw the miracles, more so than when they were uh, gifted with the, uh, the word and all of the prayers and the learnings that they had. All of those things pale in comparison to what happens to them at the transfiguration. They will never, ever be the same again. And that experience leaves them not only awestruck, but wordless and in many ways uncomprehending what it is that they've experienced. And our experience perhaps of encountering God for that first time, when we were first touched by the Spirit, and we knew our lives would never ever be the same again. We, we can't explain that. We can't put a finger on it. But we know that we have been touched, we have been changed, and we'll never be the same again. That's what the, what the disciples, James and John and Peter, experienced but to the nth degree, they experienced that. They experienced that experience of being on the mountaintop. And I have had experiences that have been otherworldly. Many of you probably have had experiences that are otherworldly. And at that time, you wish you could just freeze that moment in time, maybe build some booths, whatever it is that you can do to hold that moment in perpetuity. And yet you know that you cannot do that, that you have to come down from the mountain at some time. And when you come down from the mountain, you realize that what you have experienced has changed you in such a fashion that the colors look different, things smell differently. Your life has been uh, the term of metanoia comes to mind in the sense that you have been transformed into something new and different. And that's what I think happens at this transfiguration. It happened to the disciples. It happened to them and they have their commission now in a sense, but they don't understand it. They're bewildered. They've had this experience that has, that has been one of, of, of being awestruck. And yet they still don't understand the, the things that are going to happen to Jesus and to themselves. They don't realize that the things have been set in motion that are going to monumentally change the way they see their lives. Martha, you have something? I, I was going to say, but when they come down, it's very interesting. If you look at when they kept it to themselves, like they were told to do, and they come down and they're full of questions about what is going to happen, because Jesus has already referred to dying and being raised from the dead and this does not fit their paradigm no not at all it should be happening that's not their paradigm not at all and, and, and then forthwith following that they go into a situation where there had been someone to be healed and then we see that the disciples are also arguing among themselves about, you know, you know, who are they when the real question was first, who is he? And then we can ask the question, who are we?
Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in chapter or verse nine, verses nine to thirteen, when they're coming down the hill, they uh, are confused. They're trying to, as as you say, Martha, trying to rec uh, reconcile the paradigm that they are functioning with with a new reality that they've been presented with. And they're confused. And I am, I am uh, of the belief, and I think there are other uh, commentaries out there that would suggest that the reason that Jesus holds them to secrecy is because they, uh, they're, they're not comprehending enough. They, they have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. And, I believe uh, that. yeah. You know, and so... You know, just just keep quiet about what you saw over there because you don't understand it, and uh, if you don't understand it, then you're going to you're going to misinterpret it. As we talked about last week, the the whole concept of of the Messiah, the concept that the Jewish people had of the Messiah, was you know was some sort of uh, superhero, rootin' tootin' superhero that was going to come and overthrow the Romans reestablish, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Jewish homeland and bring them back to the days uh, that, they, they, that they had during the time of King David. And everything was, you know, everything was going to be like that. That's what the Messiah was going to do. He would be uh, tromping on his enemies and uh, tromping on their enemies and reestablishing the Jewish uh, nation as, as the foremost uh, power in the world as it was known and so this not whole, suffering mm, not suffering <laughs> not suffering you know not suffering not death on a cross that was that was you know there you said it so well martha that their paradigm has shifted drastically and uh, one of the things that happens when a paradigm shifts is that everything goes back to zero confused. it's it goes back to zero and so uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult for them to wrap their, uh, their, their minds around what, not only what they've seen, but what Jesus has told them. And so they come down the, they come down the hill and they're, they're confused. And immediately they come across an epileptic boy. We will say, um, you know, in, a, in this time, <clears throat> many things that we would consider mental or physical uh, ailments were considered to be uh, demonic events. And so if we read that carefully, we clearly see that the boy is, uh, is an epileptic. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> and so what has happened is the uh, disciples that weren't on the mountain, they have been trying to uh, to cast out this demon trying to heal this boy. And they come, and then the three plus Jesus come back and they hear the scribes uh, chit-chatting. And this is an opportunity for the for the scribes to really uh, take, take it to the disciples, say like, see, you can't do what you think you can do. And so if you can't do it, then neither can your leader. And so exactly. the scribes are, you know they have this opportunity right there to to really put the needle to <clears throat> the disciples in front of all of these people and so jesus uh jesus has had this this anointing this this uh this induction into his into his professional journey and his ministry on the mountain now comes back to mundane uh, types of things dealing with uh, individuals dealing with the backbiting and uh, and the sniping that's going on with the with the scribes and yet jesus says to the the father he says to the father the father who obviously has had some frustration because the healing that he has anticipated happening with the disciples has not taken place. And so he says to Jesus, if you are able, as if he's, he is doubting, 
he has a doubt that Jesus can do any more. And, and Jesus, much like he does with most of the people that he encounters and heals, he says to him that it's your faith that will do the healing. And so he puts that out there. And sure enough, the, uh, there's a, you know, uh, a situation where in which the boy is, is cured. And the, uh, I guess the takeaway there is that um, I put a note down that faith, what is viewed as hopeless is indeed hopeless. So if the father and the community and certainly the boy, if they feel it's hopeless, then indeed it is hopeless. Uh, if they don't believe that there is healing available and at their disposal, then nothing is going to work for them. So that's the, that's the takeaway that I have from that. And Jesus Martha, you have. says this can only come through prayer. And I found that interesting because uh, if, if you're going to uh, remove an uh, evil spirit or a seizure, you have to do that with prayer. It's not really said that the uh, disciples didn't pray, but uh, we know they were arguing among themselves and they therefore in some sense arguing and not enough faith or trust and then uh, Jesus answer, why couldn't they do it? This kind can only come out through prayer. And I think the, uh, the underlying factor there is that the disciples were all full of themselves. They were being ego driven. Their egos had gotten in the way. And they were thinking that it was they who were the healers and they're not God. And I think that is the, um, the thing that Jesus brings back to is that you cannot do this without prayer. You cannot do this on your own. This is through God that this happens, not through your, uh, not through your human efforts. You think that you are now um, the, the reason that this happens, but the reason that this happens is that it's God working through you, not you uh, doing this activity, doing this healing. And how do we keep ourselves from, how do we keep the ego out of a situation like that? You know, they've been going around <clears throat> and they've been doing that. You know, they're talking about how they've, they've gone and we've seen in previous sections, they've talked about how uh, they've seen the devil fall from the sky. They've seen the, all these things happen and they're feeling their Cheerios right now. They're feeling pretty good about themselves. Hi. You know, they're, uh, you know, look what we can do. We got all this power. And then they run across a situation where they got tripped up and it was their egos that tripped them up because they forgot what the source of their power and what the source of their healing, where that came from. And so Jesus, and I see this as a, as a rebuke in a sense, when yeah. he says to them, this requires prayer. This doesn't require you uh, demonstrating to the masses how great you are. This, uh, this, this requires you to pray and understand that God is working through you and you are not <clears throat> in charge of this. Yeah, they wanted to jump. Yeah, yeah. I think first it's very dangerous to step in something without prayer, like mm -hmm. boasting that you are the one who's, you know, going to kill the demons and that person or whatever, set them free from it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that as you step up as a team, that there has to be first a relationship among the ones that you're going to work with. 
Mm -hmm. And as you see that also with Jesus, um, it's not just happened always. You see that sometimes they were so happy there was healing and they set free uh, from possession. And then suddenly it didn't work. And mm -hmm. here in chapter nine, you see that the scribes, those guys who know supposed to be everything, and according to the law, they knew every comma and dot comma, whatever, and <laughs> nothing happened. So, mm -hmm. so what is going on? And, and, and what is Jesus telling us? I think it's the most humble place to be, as you know that God is choosing you to be that special person in mm -hmm. set people free from possession, that first there is prayer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is long prayer. And sometimes you just cannot do anything and mm -hmm. wait till you see that there is a sign. Because, you know, when I became a Christian, I learned a lot. And for me, I got a lot of revelations from God because I think God is the only one who reveals to you. Mm -hmm. And when I work with the team, uh, we know specific what we needed to do, and we needed to know one another that first, as you come as a team, as you know, set people free, which I was, I worked with the team, and it's dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're not connected to one another, you can be caught by that darkness. And so for you, it's very, very clear to be connected first to God and listen to what the spirit is telling you to do. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that you have to step out, then please step out because it's, I mean, it's a very, very dangerous spot. And I think Jesus knew exactly that he's telling his disciples, you know, it's not working mm -hmm. because your heart is not in prayer. So I tell you, prayer is the one who set that person free. So, yeah, yeah. We, 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 are, we are all familiar perhaps with, uh, with uh, faith healers that come on television and oh. they would have us believe that, uh, that they, have a, they have a unique and, and special <laughs> power. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's pure ego. That's exactly. pure ego. It's, uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not having God work through them. It's like they, have a, 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 uh, they are the, the unique and special one who has yeah. these gifts. Right. And that's a very and dangerous Tony. place to be. And many of them turned out to be phonies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With, without a doubt, there's uh, <clears throat> there's that factor in there <coughs> that uh, the ego wants to be the one that runs the show. I have a, I have a, I personify, I personify my ego as this impish little boy that runs around and wants to do what it wants to do, irrespective of what might be the right thing to do or the uh, appropriate thing to do, the ego wants to do that. So I have, this, I have this metaphor of when I feel that coming on, I take that little imp and I put him in the closet and put him away. <laughs> and so that might be abusive to, the, to my ego, but sometimes the ego gets in the way and starts to run the show. The tail begins to wag the dog. So you have to be very careful, uh, particularly in situations where, uh, as you say, you're working with people, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with a team, or you're dealing yep. with people who are wounded and dealing with people who are marginalized. Yep. And uh, you have to be very careful. One has to be very careful exactly. if one's in a, in a, in a situation of, of ministering to people is to never be in a position of, of lording over that I know more than you do, or I'm special, and uh, we're in this together. That's what Jesus is saying to each of these people when they get this healing, as he said, it's your faith that has healed you. You know, it's your faith. You've connected to your faith. And uh, the, the other metaphor that I like to use as far as staying connected is that in your house, you have outlets. And those outlets have electricity in them. <laughs> but if you don't have, if you don't plug the appliance, the lamp, or whatever into that outlet, 
you cannot access that power. The power is just there, but it's not been accessed because you haven't made the connection. So yeah. that connection with God is like that. You have to access it. You have to plug into it in order for it to be of any benefit. So moving on. Yeah. Uh, I like what follows there is that uh, the disciples saw someone healing and told that person to stop because they weren't connected with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very interesting what he said. And I, I relate it to where he has also said in my house or many mansions were mm -hmm. it not so I would have told you that there are different levels of understanding and but the power of healing speaks for itself mm -hmm. and he goes on to uh, to interact with the disciples he finds them squabbling about yeah. who is the most important and once again we see this this uh, once again is the 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 egotism rising up as to who is the best who does it best who does mother like better does mother like you better your mother's favorite uh, that whole sort of thing comes up and uh, when he takes them to the side he sits down and he begins to teach. And the sitting down is an important, that's an, imp an important posture for him yeah. to take because as a rabbi, as a teacher, one sits down to deliver their lessons. So he takes the disciples when they're going around about who's the greatest, and he begins to teach them. And um, he teaches them about what is true greatness. Who is the greatest among you is the one who would uh, would serve the, the others. I'm reminded of a homily that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King gave, and he talked, it was a homily around the Good Samaritan and the story of the Good Samaritan in which uh, all of these people passed the man who had been beaten and was laying by the side of the road, but the Samaritan person stopped and took care of him, and we all know that story. And Dr. King summed it up thusly. He said, people passed by and they asked the question, what will happen to me if I stop to help this person? And he said, the Samaritan asked the question, what will happen to that person if I don't stop to help them? Mm. And so that's a, that's a fundamental difference and that, that goes against everything that the ego wants you to do. The ego wants to protect you, wants to, uh, you know, do all of the things, all of the reasoning. Well, this guy might be dangerous. It might, you know, he might have a disease. It might be a ploy. When I stop to help him, his, his buddies are going to jump out and mug me. All of those things went through other people's mind. And indeed, those are, you know, those are, are, are valid types of concerns but the question remains not what will happen to me if i stop what will happen to him if i don't stop and so that's what jesus is teaching them about what it means to if you want to be great this is what you have to do you have to ask that question what will happen to these people if i don't do this not what will happen to me Martha, you're right. I remember when I was young uh, and naive, but idealistic, and I wanted to join the Peace Corps because mm -hmm. uh, uh, President John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask mm -hmm. what you can do for your country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that same principle Yes, I, I agree. It's uh, and it leads into the conversation <clears throat> that he has with them about uh, the individual who's 
healing and he's not part of their group. I said, that's a matter of tolerance I see there that he's teaching his disciples is that um, the question is that he says, and I think you mentioned this, Martha, the question is, he who is not against us is for us. So, you know, there are many, there are many ways to get to, to this uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do uh, approach. Uh, there are many ways to get there. And so that, you know, once again, the disciples are operating from this, the, this special sauce that they are, that they are, uh, their egos once again, hey, he's not part of our group. How can he go around preaching and healing people? He's not one of us. And um, we don't have to go very far in our world today to see individuals taking that stance, professing to be um, uh, of a, a, a certain persuasion uh, of uh, caring about people, and yet they only want to care about those people who are part of their group, not part of some other group. In fact, the other group might even be demonized and, uh, and marginalized because they're not part of the so-called in crowd. So I think Jesus is very, is very clear with them. And once again, I see it as a, as a rebuke to their, to their egos, mm -hmm. because this whole, this whole section here uh, to me, reeks of them feeling their oats, reeks of them feeling as if they've got all they need to know, and they are they are the A team, and Jesus is rebuking them and telling them in in very specific, yet very gentle ways that it's not like that. You're not to rule over. You're not to lord over others. And if someone is doing good work, and they're not part of our group. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And so I see the disciples throughout this chapter um, <clears throat> being educated, being taught both in word and deed as to what uh, they are being called to do. They've been to the mountaintop. They've had this glorious <laughs> experience, and they're filled. Uh, they're full. They're they're filled with their vitamins, and they feel as if they can do and uh, uh, anything that they that they want to because they're special and and Jesus is reeling them back in and letting them know that if you want to be special you've got to not be special which is uh, which is counter counterintuitive to them because they're still operating from the Jewish perspective of Messiah the Messiah coming and and uh, tromping out all of those who would be against us and Jesus is once again readjusting their paradigm, and they're having a difficult time with that. As do we all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, indeed. I think uh, the gospel writer understood human nature and understood that we don't take to the idea of suffering very well you know, which is going to be inevitable if you follow Jesus. The suffering may come in different ways, but there will be suffering. And it's not that we stand up and make a big deal of our suffering. We shouldn't be like the Pharisees or the others who, who put ashes on their face and went mm -hmm. around with a sad look. But, you know, that is the natural succession of events if you're mm -hmm. doing what you're supposed to do there's going to be some opposition to it in this world and we still don't have to divide into them and us all right jesus is pretty clear about that but you know two thousand years on the majority of us who profess to be spiritual religious people have missed that lesson. We need to be, we need to have Jesus sit down amongst us and teach us like a little child because we haven't heard that. We've missed that. And uh, 
And we see that all around us every day. So it's, you know, if there's, um, if that's what we used to call original sin, that's the original sin of humankind is that we, uh, we, we don't get that part of it. Yeah. That's why we need Holy Week now. That's right. We need Holy <laughs> Week. And I want to say one last thing here before we before we depart. I want to I want to take a look at the verses 43 through 48. Oh yes. Because those are those are, are sections there that are ripe for uh, abuse, misuse, and misunderstanding. Um I have uh, known people who um, have taken this vivid, colorful, rabbinic language that Jesus is using here and have tried to, not only try to, but have made it a literal interpretation of, of what, uh, what Jesus is saying. If your hand is, uh, is the one that's, that's causing you to sin, cut off your hand. Oh. If it's your eye, take your eye out. Uh, all of those sorts of things. So that, that's that's uh, that's metaphor. That's a uh, very colorful language, virtual language, visual, visually vivid language that uh, Jesus is using to. Uh, to speak to people, and he and he talks about um, you know the Gehana. Gehana is a valley was that has a very um, checkered past. It was yes. uh, on, on occasion it was used for human sacrifices. It was used yeah. to uh, to do all sorts of of, of deadly things, and so. It is in every way, shape, or form um, the metaphor for hell. It is uh, it is un, un, unclean. It is a place for massive suffering, and so uh, that term comes up. Gehenna comes up, uh, and the people at that time would know that that's uh, you know that's like a nuclear waste dump. Uh, be like. Uh, Ground Zero in Hiroshima. Uh, it, it is so repulsive and so uh, and so unholy that it is very easy for them to uh, visually associate Gahana with what he's talking about. And once again, it's it's um, it's language that is used as an excessive metaphor, a metaphor of excess. And it's not to be taken literally. It's not to be taken, you know, that you're going around uh, digging your eyes out or committing, uh, cutting your, your hands off. We had a, an instance here just in the last week or so where this, uh, this young man went in and murdered a bunch of people because he thought it. He thought that that was the thing to do because these people were causing him to sin. Uh, he had a sexual uh, addiction problem, and so he felt that it was his duty to uh, to take that very literally and and kill these people because they were his uh, what we used to call a near occasion of sin, and that is just blatantly incorrect. That's an incorrect, and I I understand that he was. Uh, he was involved in a religious organization. I don't know which one, but if they were reading very this, fun, very hmm? fundamentalist church. Yes, and they're and they're reading this literally, and then they're going out and committing all sorts of atrocities <clears throat> because the scripture tells them to to do this, and uh, that's not that's not the case. Uh, it's uh, it's language that would have been familiar in the Middle East, in the Semitic culture, right. would have been the teaching. And, you know, we see the same sort of thing with, uh, with some of the fundamentals, some radical fundamentalists in the Middle East reading their Koran 
in the same sort of way. And that's not the that's not to be taken literally. And unfortunately, we have people that that read this and are not understanding that this is a a uh, a teaching style, a uh, metaphor. Yeah. And I think that um, we need to keep that in mind when we read things and we uh, come across things that we're looking at things from 2000 plus years, 3000 plus, if we're reading the, uh, the Hebrew scripture, we're looking at things that uh, had a different meaning and a different place and understanding to those than we do today. Exactly. Well, so, this has been very good. Yeah. So please, no one, please, this Holy Week, don't go around defacing yourself or defacing anyone else in the name of God, because that's not what you're called to do. No. No. Any other thoughts or questions? Any questions? Comments? Well, I don't think, John, we put them to sleep, but they're quiet tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, you know, it's like having a, a big meal. You know, yeah. we had a lot, we had a heavy meal. And so yeah. we had a, we had a heavy chapter. So, you yes, know, the tryptamine is working through them right now and they've got to go <laughs> take a nap. <laughs> we did want to say before we go, we're, we're going to take a, a break here at Easter time. Mm -hmm. We're going to be off the next two Mondays. And then we'll pick up again. What is the date? Then? April 19. April 19. We'll pick up again. So, so it's all on the Bible study group, probably on Facebook. Right. You already saw it. And I also send an email out. So uh, in this two weeks, then that you're going to go to Fort Lauderdale for spring break. And... <laughs> no, we're hoping to get one day, the day after <laughs> Easter to go down and look at the flowers uh, down in, in uh, San Diego County. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, when I was growing up in San Diego County, that used to, those flowers used to be from Del Mar almost all the way to San Clemente uh, alongside the road. Now they have a, uh, they have a very limited little section called the flower fields. Which, yeah, we're uh, gonna go there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, more of a uh, uh, just a little nugget of what used to be back in the day yeah. before, uh, you know, development took over. Yeah. But that should be fun. Make sure you wear your mask. <laughs> oh, they <laughs> won't let you in without it. <laughs> okay. Even though we both yeah. had our shots. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to I don't want to see. I don't want to see you on the evening news. <laughs> <laughs> priests arrested <laughs> well that would be fun but for what reason yeah. you end in prayer All right, everyone um, let's have a prayer and you guys yeah. have a good Easter a good uh, holy week and good Easter and we'll be back on the 19th yeah and uh, we'll be looking at chapter 10 when we come back. Yeah. Right. So if you get to look, see ahead, we'll try to post some things for you in between there. So, Lord, I thank you for those where we can come together, not only to study, but to work together in your behalf to be servants like you intend us to be that we can share the word and we can share the work and that we can lean on you trust in you to do the work that we are instruments and at times very poor ones but you got us lord you said you wanted us and you got us so we pray for everyone to have a good, restful, and good experience in the next week with Holy Week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Amen.
Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Blessings to you. Blessings. And see you soon, okay? Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Gabe. Right. Bye, bye, Gabe. Bye, 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 Bernie. Bye, bye, Rebecca. Gabe. Bye, Mary. Bye, Father John. I heard your man showed up on Sunday, so you bring him back again. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.